Our keynote speaker today is Mr. Brett Erickson. Brett Erickson grew up here in the Valley in McAllen, Texas. He attended Texas Tech University in Lubbock where he had obtained a BS in Agricultural and Applied Economics. He eventually went to work as an agronomist for Pioneer Hybrid DuPont in Westlaco, Texas, where he helped produce seed corn for the Latin American market. After three years in, in Hawaii as an assistant plant manager, Brett decided to return to Texas. He began working as a project coordinator for the Texas Citrus Mutual and Texas Vegetable Association in Mission, Texas. In July of 2012, after nearly two years with TCM and TVA, Brett joined the Texas International Produce Association as Senior Vice President. On January 1st of this year, Brett accepted the position of President and CEO of TIPA. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Brett Erickson. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, my name is Brett Erickson. I'm president of the Texas International Produce Association. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. I appreciate Mario inviting me to come speak and um, talk about some of the exciting things that are happening within our industry. Um, I see quite a few friends of mine out in the audience, a lot of you folks I work with on a regular basis. Um, we are, although I'm in the produce business, we're all connected um, very closely in a lot of ways. So my presentation today, the title that I was given was uh, El Puente Baguate, the next economic tsunami for the region. And um, depends on what your definition of tsunami is, but um, something is occurring. And uh, there, is, there, are, there are changes ahead, and there is a lot of opportunity for us. Um, and with that comes a lot of challenges. Um, so she went through some of my backgrounds. I, I grew up here in South Texas. Uh, we moved down here in about 1980. My folks both worked at the university um, at, at Pan American. Um, and um, I work with Pioneer doing seed corn production. And we were always in the export markets. Everything I, I did was um, for export. Um, so a little bit of background on the association. Um, the, Texas Produce the Texas Produce Association, TPA, was founded in 1942. Um, it was founded um, with a focus on expanding uh, markets and business opportunities for Texas-grown fruits and vegetables. Um, over the years, that began to change. In 1996, um, the Produce Association created what they called the Shipper and International Trade Division to address problems and opportunities surrounding the importation of foreign-grown products. So that tells you all the way back, really, back in the early 90s, there were already issues cropping up related to the international trade of foreign grown fruits and vegetables. Primarily, we're talking about Mexico. Um, in 2012, the Texas Produce Association became Texas International Produce Association. Um, and we also created what was called the Border Issues Management Program. Um, the Border Issues Management Program is designed to address the growing number of issues related to international trade. Um, it also, this was a unique opportunity for us to allow importers to join the association where we had always only had domestic grower shippers and allied industry people such as chemical companies and box companies, um, food safety labs and such. Um, with this new division that we created, it allowed us to bring people who are only importing fruits and vegetables to join the association. Um, and the reason that, there, that we realized that there was a demand and we were spending more and more time of, of, of our efforts working on international trade issues, frankly, um, we, we probably were spending 70% of our time these days working on international trade issues that were cropping up uh, related to um, fruits and vegetables from Mexico coming into the U.S. Um, so Texas International Produce Association is the only association working on these type of issues specific to the produce industry here in Texas. We have some very good partnerships. You can't navigate this industry without the partnerships. Um, we're fortunate to have a good relationship with the Fresh Produce Association of the Americas. They're based out of Nogales, Arizona. 
and we also have a very good relationship with the Board of Trade Alliance. We have a lot of common interests and, and we're appreciative. I see my friend Mr. Bale here. We work together quite a bit on a number of issues. Um, and uh, Jesse Herford, who's the chairman of the BTA, um, they're great friends and good colleagues on a lot of these issues that we're pushing. Um, our association, we have over 125 members. Um, our membership has grown about 30% in the last um, year alone. A lot of that is because of the, the, the change of, of the focus on international trade um, and opening our doors to um, importer organizations. Um, we've got great relationships with our federal agencies, Customs and Border Protection, um, USDA, um, FDA, um, also with our, our state reps and state senators, um, as well as our U.S. senators and um, congressmen. We spend a lot of time in Washington working closely with, um, with our representatives up there trying to get help at our ports down here in Texas. Um, in, a, in addition to focusing on domestic ag policy, we're obviously focused on improving the um, overall trade flow, trade flow. We're interested in seeing trucks move quickly and efficiently across the borders. Um, this is a, a critical component of our industry. Um, just like in the, the maquila and manufactured goods industries, um, we're all trying to get to a final customer, um, but produce has the added difficulty of being in incredibly perishable. So, you know, the maquila guys, they, they need to get their product delivered just in time to, to their customer wherever they're going. So do the produce guys. But every day that um, produce is delayed, it's losing value um, and it's losing shelf life. Um, as another thing that we do with the association is we do a couple of conferences a year. We, some of you may have attended our America Trades Produce Conference. It's held um, usually in March. Uh, we, three years ago, we held it in McAllen at the McAllen Convention Center. Um, then it went to Nogales, Arizona. This past year, it was back in McAllen, Texas. And it's, um, it's focused on produce and international trade issues. We also do a Texas Produce Convention that um, we used to hold historically in Padre Island and, and it has grown to the point where we've had to move it um, out of the valley. We've held it in San Antonio um, the last couple of years. Um, we also do a big event at Produce Marketing Association show. Um, this year will be in New Orleans, um, Fresh Summit. We do a Texas town in that um, where we bring all of our Texas companies. They can come in under the umbrella of Texas and um, get some additional um, star shine while they're there. Um, and then we have golf tournaments and the such just um, to provide networking opportunities for our members. So imports, they're on the rise. Talking about produce, I'm, I'm the produce guy, so bear in mind everything I'm talking to you about is in terms of produce. But with that, um, th a lot of these changes are also occurring in the manufacturing sector. Um, increasing imports, nearly two-thirds, this is an, a, an interesting fact, nearly two-thirds of all fresh fruits and vegetables that are consumed in or shipped out of Texas, about 60 percent are come from Mexico. 30 to 35 percent of all fresh produce consumed in the United States now um, is imported, the vast majority coming through Mexico. Uh, this is an interesting fact and often people don't believe me when I tell them, but Based, this is USDA Ag Marketing Service data. Texas has surpassed Arizona three of the last four years in terms of total produce um, imports. Um, Arizona has always been king of, of produce imports. Nogales is still the number one bridge. Um, FAR is rapidly closing in on that mark. But when you look at our primary bridges, Rio Grande City, Progreso, um, FAR has the lion's share. and. Um, Far Progresso and um, Rio Grande City. Those, those bridges make up the bulk of produce that comes across uh, in Texas and, and we have surpassed Arizona. This is a chart showing a volume comparison between Texas, Arizona, and California from 2007 to 2012. Texas is the blue line um, and you can see that where that change really in 2009, 2010, that change starts to accelerate um, and we start to widen the gap um, between Texas and Arizona.
These are 2012 produce volumes by port of entry. Um, it's a breakdown. Of, so in 2012, Texas crossed approximately 160,000 loads of truckload equivalents of produce. Uh, the lion's share was across the far bridge. That represents, that orange slice of the pie represents about 100,000 loads of produce. Uh, next was Laredo and Progreso. They're pretty close, Rio Grande City. Um, and then down the line, the, the rest are, are rather small, small amounts. But far, Laredo, Progreso, Rio Grande City, those, are, those, those hold the lion's share. This is just, a lot of times people say, well, what kind of commodities are we crossing? What type of volumes? This is a breakdown of, in 2012, Texas's top 25 commodities that were imported. Um, at the top of the list, you've got tomatoes that, that's consolidated into, into, there's various types of tomatoes, but it, we consolidate that into all, all the tomato types, um, followed by avocados, limes, watermelons, mangoes, onions, and then it goes on down the list. So why the increase? I stole this, um, this picture slide from a, a friend at, um, at FAR, so you'll see all arrows point to FAR, but I'm saying all arrows point to, to Texas ports of entry. Um, you have, when you look at this map, and you're talking about fresh produce, you're seeing a shift coming to Texas because anybody who's gonna ship produce to the West Market is gonna continue shipping up through California or through Nogales. But if you're shipping to the Midwest and the East Coast, which is where you've got rapidly increasing, um, got rapidly increasing populations, um, and you've got some new infrastructure that I'm going to talk about here soon, um, coming up through Texas gets it there a lot quicker and a lot cheaper. And it's great to save money for the businessmen, and the faster you can get the product on the shelves, considering the perishability of produce, um, that's critical. This is just a picture of um, the Bawate Bridge. I'm sure many of you have seen, seen it. Um, it's quite an engineering feat. Um, I believe it's the largest span bridge ever built. Um, and I understand you can set the, the Eiffel Tower underneath it and still have something like 100 feet uh, between that and the, the bottom of the bridge. So, why the increase in Texas imports? The biggest piece, and what we're here talking about today, a lot of you are, are hearing about, is the development of the Mazatlan Durango Highway, um, also known as the Interoceanic Economic Corridor. Uh, the Bawarte Bridge, Mazatlan Durango Highway, is going to create significant time and cost savings for delivering product to the U.S., particularly the Midwest and East Coast markets. You're looking at six to eight hour time savings estimated once the bridge is complete. Six to eight hour time savings for product originating from the Mazatlan area to South Texas. So from Mazatlan to South Texas, any of the South Texas ports, at that point alone, the, the, each load is saving five or six hundred dollars just to that point. When you look at a final destination, maybe you're going to Chicago or um, Carolinas or Georgia, wherever it is that you're going, when you look at the final destination and you include the fact that a lot of these trucks have to do a round trip, you're talking about potential savings of up to $2,500 um, depending on if you own your own trucks and if you're going round trip or not and what the cost of gasoline is, but you, between fuel and driver costs, Estimates of over $2,500 a truck. So even if it's $1,500 a truck, you think about the savings for, for some of these importers who are bringing in an individual company who may be bringing in 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 loads a year. It, you are talking about tremendous um, dollar savings. In 2012, we crossed 160,000 loads of produce. You, say it's $1,000 per load. You, you're talking about incredible savings for these companies. The, the fact that this corridor brings it up through South Texas gives our region an incredible opportunity here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the growth we're already seeing, but the business opportunities that, that we're already seeing um, are incredible. Approximately 80% of the 
um, just to give some perspective, about 80% of the fresh uh, produce coming across comes from the state of Sinaloa. So the majority of the produce is coming from that region, um, and it's coming here to South Texas. It's already happening. And numerous Arizona operations are already running product through Texas. Um, every day I'm hearing about a Nogales-based uh, organization that is here looking at property. Um, they're looking to open a shed. We've had a number of new members come into our association who will continue to have their Nogales-based operation, but they are, are expanding here in South Texas and opening facilities here in South Texas. They're hiring people here in South Texas. They're bringing their brokers to South Texas. Brokers are hiring people to man their office staffs. Um, you've got to have forklift operators. All this comes with the growth that we're experiencing here in Texas. Rapidly growing pop, okay, so away from the, aside from the fact that we've got the mazatlan Durango Highway that is basically a pipeline that is, that is gonna pump product, money, jobs right into our region. Um, you've got some other factors that are, are playing in on the growth of produce imports. Uh, we have a rapidly growing population. Um, in the next 30, 40 years, our, our global population is, I think, supposed to be at 9 billion people. Um, so with, with the growing population, Texas is, has a rapidly growing state population. It's a great state to do business in. Um, we're doing very well. We're attracting businesses all the time. People are moving to Texas to do business and live. Um, so you've got increasing demand. So you've got to feed all these folks that are coming to Texas, all the folks, you know, our growing population here in the United States. Mexico has been incredibly aggressive in supplying U.S. demand. And a couple of examples I have is there's been huge growth in the avocado market. I mean, you can't help but watch TV these days and not see a commercial for, for avocados. They are they're going gangbusters. Um, tomatoes, Mexican tomatoes. The, the growth of the, the greenhouse industry in Mexico in the last six or seven years is something like 1,200%. Um, they provide a very good product and they can provide it year round. It's a high quality product that, that we can get year round. So that's why we see such a tremendous number of tomatoes coming in. This is a worrisome piece that the Texas International Produce Association, we do focus a lot on international trade issues and the importation of fruits and vegetables, but we also still have our roots in Texas agriculture and we still represent Texas domestic interests. Um, I recently saw a report by the Texas Department of Agriculture that stated Texas was losing 200 acres of ag production land per day. 200 acres per day. Now, why are we losing 200 acres of ag production lands a day? One is increasing regulatory pressures on farmers. Uh, pesticides, pesticide safety, and the record keeping that growers have to do, and um, on the farm safety. Agricultural products are, and, and growers, they are heavily regulated, and, and it makes it difficult for growers to make a living. Political uncertainty. We've got a lot, obviously, we've got a lot of political uncertainty. We haven't had a farm bill now for a while. It's something we've been pushing for for some time. Um, hopefully, we get one sometime soon, but without a farm bill, these growers, they don't have the certainty of knowing what they're going to be able to do the following year. Um, a large, or you hear in the news a lot, we've got a, a big issue with water. Um, we are, in a, we are in a, have been in a persistent drought now for three or four years. Um, it's cost hundreds of millions of dollars to our, to our agricultural producers. Um, you know, we were fortunate that we had a few weeks of rain here recently. Um, the dialogue going back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. on repaying the water debt, and, um, but you know, Mexico has, they have got their water issues as well. We've got an old, outdated, decrepit irrigation delivery system. Um, you look in California, they have water shortage too, but their water delivery systems for, for, for agricultural irrigation, they lose something like five to 10% of their irrigation water. In our delivery systems, we lose something like 50% of the water before it ever gets to the field. We still use, flood irrigation, we've got open ditches, they're cracked, they're broken, we, um, you've got evaporation, we lose a lot of water just 
in being delivered to the field. In the future, that's going to be a significant challenge that um, we find a way to be more conservative in, or more conser find more conservative ways to deliver our water. Um, but nonetheless, water, water shortages add to agricultural issues. You've got an aging farmer population. The average age of a grower now is 60 years old and you don't have young kids getting into the business. It's capital and labor intensive. It caught, they don't have the, the, the money to, to buy land. They don't have the money to buy equipment, to buy a, a $350,000 tractor. It's, um, it, it's difficult for young people to get into the business. So you have fewer growers, you have less, less ag lands um, to grow on. And so it's creating, it's creating demand, and somebody's going somebody's to gonna fill that demand. Mexico has been very good about it. Um, Central and South America, Asia, all these are, are areas that are, are going to be filling our demand for agricultural goods. So where is the tsunami? The tsunami is happening. Um, or a surge. I say surge, generally. Um, We've had a 67% increase in our produce volumes here in Texas in just about the last six years alone. Uh, we've had double-digit growth four of the last five years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Texas sur has surpassed Arizona three of the last four years. Arizona businesses are here. They're setting up shop in our, in our towns. They're setting up shop down here in the trade zone. They're looking in Mission. They're looking in FAR. They're looking in McAllen. <clears throat> the, Mazatlan Durango Highway is still not fully functional. Um, according to eyewitness accounts, folks that have been down on the ground, um, who have traveled the entire length of, of the, the new highway, I've heard estimates that it's 85 to 90 percent complete. You talk to the, the politicians in Mexico, you'll hear, um, I have heard October of this year. Realistically, we think that um, based on what we're hearing from um, the folks who've talked to the laborers and the engineers on the ground in Mexico that um, probably sometime first quarter of 2014 when that opens. So the current economic impact of produce imports in Texas, I'm going to talk about 2012, kind of give you a, a perspective of where we are at now and where we're headed. In 2012 we brought in 100, about 160,000 loads worth of produce into Texas. That's an estimated value of about $3.5 billion in product. What does that mean for our state? That means about $285 million in eco direct economic impact. That came from a study from uh, Texas A&M University, creating about 3,037 jobs. Most of those are, are here. So in the next eight years, we had, we had a study done by Texas A&M University out of College Station, their Center for North American Studies. Um, and, and I would like to thank um, Keith Patridge from McAllen, Juan Guetta from City of Far, um, Alex Mead from City of Mission. They, they um, partnered with us. And um, we're a small organization, and we run a razor-thin budget, so we don't have a lot of money, so I had to go begging. and pleading and, and these guys agreed to, to help fund the study. But it was an important study because we, I've been going around for the last year and a half now saying, well, we're going to have tremendous amounts of, of growth here. We need more federal resources. You know, I'm talking to the folks in Washington at CBP or I'm talking to the, the staffer for Congressman Bella or Congressman Cuellar or, or Senator Cornyn and they say, well, how much growth are we talking about? Well, I don't know, but it's a lot. And so I had enough requests that people said, you know, if we could get some kind of data, some kind of numbers, it would help, it would help us in what we're asking for such that we can help you down in Texas. So in the study, um, they looked at the, they did um, a linear analysis where, and they, they looked at historical data and, and then extrapolated that out in a linear trend. And then they also, uh, worked with us to, to meet with local brokers, um, produce importers. They talked to folks from Nogales, from folks from Texas, and did some survey work and tried to, to wrap their hands around, okay, so 
if we're just going to look at straight line growth, this is where it's going to be. Now, if we take into consideration there's a highway coming in, and we're going to talk to the business people who are having to prepare their budgets for the next year, let's, let's put some real numbers to it and, and look at where we're headed. So when they finish the analysis, you're looking at 127% increase in the volumes of, of truckloads coming into Texas by 2020. Last year, we were at 160,000 loads. By 2020, we're looking at 360,000 loads. Bear in mind, I'm only talking about produce. We're not talking about the maquila industry, the, the manufactured goods that are gonna become booming into our region because of this new highway system as well. You're talking about an estimated total annual value of $7 billion worth of product coming into this region, creating an economic impact of $650 million. That is some tremendous growth. Nearly 7,000 jobs by 2020, almost doubling our number of jobs by 2020 related to this industry. This is just a graphical representation of, of the growth. Um, the, the blue cylinders represent actual numbers. The, um, the red um, are projected numbers of straight line growth in addition to um, the survey information. And the, survey, or the, the tsunami, I guess you would call it, or the surge, you can, you can see the two big jumps in the next couple of years, 2014 and 2015. That's a 30% jump each of those, of those couple, two years. Now, whether it happens and starts happening in 2014 or late 2014 or maybe the highway takes a little bit longer, um, the jump, that surge, is, the surge is coming. And, and that's evidenced by the fact that we're ramping up our volumes here. You talk to our brokers, they're saying, my season has not ended. Generally, I get busy October, November, December. My season hasn't ended. I'm, I'm steady all the time. It's like, it's like one continuous season just this last year. This is a breakdown by year um, from the analysis that the Texas A&M University did um, from 2007 through 2020. Um, those are actual years, 2007 through 2012, and then the rest are projections. Um, but you look at Texas's growth rate um, year over year, 30% growth 2014, 30% growth 2015, and then, it, and then it dips down back to um, more of what they're expecting to be the, the straight line, more of what they consider straight line growth. Um, I've talked to some folks and they say, I think this is conservative. I've also talked to some folks that think, eh, I don't know, you know, maybe you're, that's a little bit pie in the sky, but I have heard more people than not say, I don't know, I think that's conservative. This is um, another chart here showing the anticipated growth, um, same numbers, but it, Texas is the green sections, Arizona is the red sections, um, California is the, the blue, and uh, New Mexico is, is the yellow. And that's, that's the anticipated total growth um, through 2020. Now, you, you look at this chart, and basically, the numbers, the, as a whole, the numbers are pretty much straight line growth based on their model and based on population growth and demand and new markets opening up and new commodities coming in. Um, but what, what is different in this chart is that it's that Texas surge that's happening f for us because of the mazatlan Durango Highway primarily um, it would be the biggest catalyst for, for the changes that are already occurring here. So with economic opportunity comes a growing number of challenges. Um, more maquila traffic is coming. We know that. More agricultural imports are coming from Central, South Amer Central and South America as well as Asia. Um, there has been, there's been difficulties in the last couple of years coming into the seaports on the West Coast, labor strikes and union problems. Um, with this new highway coming into Mexico, they're already running test, test containers 
into the seaports of Mazatlan and bringing them up through Mexico. I think we're only going to see that continue. With all that growth, of course, of course comes port congestion um, and increasing wait times, which is already a concern that we have. It's a battle that we're fighting all the time. Um, when we're in Washington making our ask, it usually has to do with wait times and that we need more federal resources at our bridges. Um, we've already got a shortage. We're going to have a bigger shortage if we don't get the resources that we need um, for Customs and Border Protection. We need more guys in blue. We need more FDA inspectors. We need more USDA APHIS personnel. With all this new product coming in, we also have um, increasing invasive pest pressures. And that brings a whole other slew of problems for the industry. <clears throat> As an association that represents both import side of things and domestic agriculture, um, one of our top priorities is protecting our domestic agriculture from invasive pests, invasive species. Um, so with all these new products coming in from all over the world, um, you've got a lot, a lot a lot higher number of pests that we haven't seen before coming in. And with that, the USDA APHIS gets more restrictive on their approach, trying to do their job and protect U.S. domestic agriculture from these pests. But it also starts to create backlogs at the bridges and it creates delays um, on identifying insects. And we haven't seen this one before and this one has an antenna we haven't seen and we need to identify it down to a new level and now you've got a pest problem and these trucks are, it's, it's a, a pest may move from um, reportable, meaning it's, we have it, they just make a note of it and send the truck on its way, to actionable. We recently had a, had a problem with that where they changed the status of a pest that had been coming in for years, but they had identified it, they had the technology to identify it down to a new level because they have a more restrictive approach to all these products that are coming in. And now all of a sudden, nobody can bring in cabbage because this very common beetle, which doesn't particularly pay an, an, an economic threat to our industries, um, USDA changed the status of it. So it created um, serious costs and, and delays for folks who are bringing in cabbage and other greens. Um, we've got the implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act that's, that's coming. And it's going to require, it, it is requiring U.S. producers to, um, to, to grow and pack their, their product um, with much more stringent standards. And there is a foreign component to that, the Foreign Supplier Verification Act. And that is going to require any, in, any produce that's imported into the United States that they're going to have to prove that that was, was manu or grown and handled just the same way as, as the product here in the United States. And it's going to be very difficult to police that, especially considering the fact that FDA is short on resources as, as it is. Labor for the industry. We're looking at doubling the number of jobs required here in the next seven, eight years. Um, we're also competing with the Eagle Ford Shale. Um, it's, they're taking folks away like crazy, working in that industry. They're making good money. Um, I was talking to a, a broker yesterday, said, man, we can't get any good help. We can't get anybody here because everybody's getting hauled off to, to work in the oil fields. <clears throat> so how do we address these challenges? Um, the answer, and why a lot of you are here today and why this conference was put on by Mario um, and STC is innovation. And whether you're talking about innovative thinking or you're talking about technology, um, that's how we're going to address the challenges that are coming um, through collaborative partnerships, uh, workflow design. You look at um, what's happening at the bridges and the way that they design the bridges and the flow of trucks. All that is, is critical. And it's, it's a, there, it, there are a million things that we're going to need to do and there's not going to be one, any, one silver bullet. There's going to be lots of bits and pieces that we're going to have to fit together to make things work. These are some examples that I thought of or that I thought were, took innovative thinking in, in most cases. Um, we re recently had the passage of 
um, HB 474 that created an overweight corridor here, um, basically from the Far Bridge um, down Military Highway and, and through the Mission Industrial Park and down to Ansel Duis Bridge. Um, and it's going to allow for trucks to carry loads up to 125,000 pounds. That's innovative thinking because Mexico has, a, a, they allow trucks up to that weight on their side. We only allow 80,000 pounds. So a lot of folks were shipping their product with, with 90 or 100,000 pounds worth of product up to the bridge. Then they'd have to unload it into two different trucks. And so now you've got two trucks crossing the bridge where you could have one. Additionally, that overweight corridor is going to save folks a whole lot of money um, on their shipping costs. I've heard estimates um, of up to 25% per load on shipping costs. So solutions like the overweight corridor, that's something that can help alleviate some of the, the, um, the wait times at our bridges by reducing number of trucks. Uh, APHIS recently announced the hiring of an insect identifier for the far port of entry. Now, I guess you could say that's not innovative thinking, it would be common sense, but it took a lot of work to get that done, believe it or not, to get one person hired at the Farinosa Bridge where 100,000 loads of produce cross annually. You would think they would have an insect identifier there, and um, thanks to the help of a lot of folks, including our friends at the BTA, we were able to, to get them to hire an insect identifier that is now posted um, at the Farinosa Bridge. Why is that important? Well, because before they were located in Los Indios. So when, when produce trucks were coming across, um, the CBP egg specialists would have to, they would collect the insect specimen, they would have to pin it, and they would have to take pictures of certain angles, and, and then they would email those pictures to the inspectors in Los Indios. They might have to do that 40 or 50 times a day. So now you've got a, a, a CBP egg specialist inspector, and they're just taking pictures. They could be doing something else. Um, and of those 40 or 50 insect samples, maybe they couldn't identify four or five, and so they needed the physical specimen. Now you've got to have a CBP egg specialist drive the insect specimen from the far bridge to Los Indios, one hour each way. So two hours round trip that now you don't have that inspector on the bridge doing what they should otherwise be doing. So the fact that we were able to get an insect identifier placed at the Far Inosa Bridge, that's a big win. Maybe even more important than that is along with that addition of an insect identifier, working with USDA APHIS, one thing we were pushing for was, was an expansion of the cargo release authority for these CBP egg specialists. Basically, these guys, they have no authority to, to say, yes, that insect can pass or it can't. Um, it's very limited, the number of insects that they can do that for. What we had been pushing for is to say, APHIS, we want you guys to, to do more training with the CBP egg specialist so that we don't have to send the insect to USDA. You guys can identify it and, and release it yourself. CBP is all for that. CBP is just like the business people here. C CBP, they want trucks to move across the bridge as fast as possible. FDA wants the trucks to move across the bridge as fast as possible. USDA doesn't want to hold up trucks. We all want the same thing, but we've got to get at it from different angles. But, so one of the important pieces that came out of that was that CBP, or USDA announced a pilot program with the placement of that insect identifier where they're going to be conducting training with CBP Ag specialists to expand the cargo release authority for, um, for the CBP folks. And that is, that's going to be a big win. That is going to help expedite truck traffic. And the Makila folks may say, I don't care what bug is on that insect, but if your truck is held up because they've got ag trucks in front of it, and ag trucks are the most labor intensive, you know, everybody's held up. Um, there was an um, import border impact study passed by the Texas legislature um, with a possibility of a, a possible state-federal partnership. Representative Guerra worked on a bill that would have Texas Department of Agriculture inspectors uh, help assist shorthanded CBP ag specialists at the ports of entry um, and or USDA insect identifiers in any way that, that they could to help the movement of trucks because we're short staffed. So what, can, what could the state do to help? It didn't pass the, legislator in the legislature in the form that it originally came in, but 
the legislature did mandate that Texas Department of Agriculture conduct a study, which means our industry is getting more attention. And, and the more attention we can get, the more attention we can garner and, and spread our message to say, hey, we need help. Um, you know, we don't want our trucks waiting and, and our trucks are holding up your trucks. Let's all work together to find a way to fix this. Um, it's what it takes. We have had a doubling of our FDA inspectors in the last year. Um, we have been harping on our folks in Washington that we need more FDA inspectors. We had four um, at, the, at the FAR bridge, and Nogales had 15. No, FAR isn't that far behind Nogales. Why do they have 15 and we've got four? We've been able to make that case, and they've been, um, FDA has slowly been moving, moving um, resources to our region. They recognize the growth that we're having. They recognize the, the, the slowdown in growth that Nogales is having and Arizona is having. And um, we are getting more resources here. Creation of public-private partnerships that allow private industry, that allow cities, counties, and others to work with federal agencies to address staffing needs and build infrastructure. From the association standpoint, we have kind of not, not taken a, a, a stance one way or the other on that. We've got members who say, whatever it takes to get my trucks across faster, let's do it. We've got members who say, I don't know, it's, I think it's the federal government's responsibility to take care of, of their inspections. Well, the precedent's already been set. I mean, you can already, you can already over, order overtime, and it's done on a regular basis for the USDA insect identifiers. It's, it's a very common practice. It's widely used by the importers and brokers. Um, so that is a potential tool that will help us expedite the movement of truck traffic and it becomes a business decision in the end, you know, so if it costs a guy a couple more bucks or five bucks a truck and he's going to get his truck across today versus two days from now, it makes sense that, you know, maybe I'm willing to, to pitch in for this. You've got technology improvements such as the e-beam facility to imp that improves food safety. Um, that's a, a project that hopefully is coming down here soon. I know there's a lot of work being done on it. We have work with... Um, Chip Starnes, at, um, and uh, he, I know he's worked close with McAllen Economic Development Group to, to bring a facility like that down here that would help make food safer and you know, have the capacity to, to run the type of volumes that we've got here through that. Um, it would be a tremendous boon for our industry. Um, improved design flow at the ports of entry. I'm, I'm amazed at the amount of work that the city of FAR has done in, in redesigning and the plans they've got for improving the flow of the way trucks come in and the way trucks go out and there's two lanes here and one lane here and, and, it's, and it's done all by all this expert analysis and, and it's about workflow design and workplace design and you, you see it in corporate America and you see it in the manufacturing plans and those are things that are being applied to things like our bridges that need to be applied so that we can get trucks across more quickly. So in conclusion, um, Overall, our import growth here in the next 10 years, uh, it's going to be significant, particularly in Texas. It's going to be huge. Talking about produce imports, we know, we know that it's going to be big because it's already happening. You combine that with the manufactured goods that are going to be coming. There are folks who are much more well qualified than I am to speak about the growth that's happening, but uh, you know, I hear about all this growth that's happening with manufacturing plants in the Bajio region. Um, pipe, a, a, a natural gas, 42 inch natural gas pipeline that's going from the um, Eagle Ford Shell down to, to that area to supply natural gas. Um, from the manufacturer side, it's going to be tremendous, and they're going to be taking advantage of this new highway coming in as well. Um, from our perspective in the, in the produce industry, and probably I think for any industry we can say this, there's, there is a continued movement towards a global marketplace. There is no question um, ag acres are decreasing in the U.S. Like I said, the average age of a grower is 60. Um, you've got to fill that void somewhere, and it's through a global marketplace. Produce imports will continue to contribute to the economic growth of our region, um, and it's simply because of where we are on the map in relation to where that new highway is. We are, it would, you know, I feel like the produce industry, the import industry, has hit the lottery with, with the um, building of this new highway. Um, ultimately, Innovative thinking combined with our close working partnerships with our federal agencies, our local cities, our state and federal elected officials, and our Mexican counterparts 
um, is critical if we're going to take advantage of the opportunities that we've got before us. So, with that, um, I think that's my last slide. Thank you.